So now, in the final part of the uh, course, we discuss uh, uh, in the in some fairly good detail what happens when you uh, implant semiconductors. As mentioned many times during the course, uh, this is uh, money-wise uh, uh, by a good margin the most important uh, radiation effects uh, because this uh, manufacturing of semiconductors for computers and mobile phones is of course a huge industry nowadays. And this ion implantation part can be estimated to be multi-billion dollar industry per year uh, worldwide. Uh, so uh, what happens here, in principle, you want to get uh, dopant atoms, uh, the dopants which I mentioned in the previous subsection, uh, into a desired depth of the material. And uh, so you do an implantation. And uh, this is something by this stage of the course you should be quite well familiar with, uh, because earlier on the course we discussed uh, how deep uh, uh, energetic particles interact, uh, inter uh, go into materials. And specifically for ions, uh, we have described both the binary collision approximation BCA and the molecular dynamics in the recall interaction approximation methods, which can be used to simulate this. And with these methods, one can in uh, almost all cases uh, nowadays predict quite reliably how deep the ions go. And this is something the industry uses uh, when they design the uh, doping process, where uh, one of the key factors is uh, how deep uh, your dopants go, which relates to the size of the semiconductor circuit. But this is only the pro beginning, and it's actually much more complicated physically what happens. So after, all, after you keep implanting, you get to the high dose effect and you amorphize uh, silicon. And, um, and this is something which can be measured, with, uh, for instance, with a method called Rutherford backscattering channeling, uh, where, uh, where you basically measure how much uh, helium is backscattered due to defect atoms in crystal channels. And what's observed in very many experiments, uh, this particular experiment from my, our, our own lab uh, is just an example of many, many experiments like this, uh, show that after a certain ir irradiation dose, you get uh, highly disordered material, uh, which is uh, uh, either at or close to the uh, so-called uh, amorphous level. Um, and. Uh, and, uh, and this uh, is happens, uh, roughly speaking, for typical dopants, one can say that the uh, fluencies are of the order of 10 to the power of 15. Of course, if the ions are very light or very heavy, this may be different. But uh, a somewhat more accurate estimate is uh, uh, from an old study in the 1970s, says that uh, if your nuclear energy deposition, which PCA and MDREA can also give, if the nuclear energy deposition is of the order of 6 times 10 to the power 23 EV per cubic centimeter, you get amorphization. But then the question is, well, how the physical question of interest is, of course, how does the amorphization proceed? And uh, this has been debated for a long time. Uh, there have been two basic models, uh, so-called heterogeneous or direct impact amorphization, which means that you make Morphous pockets uh, and these uh, lead to full amorphization. The other idea is that you introduce a lot of point defects, more or less homogeneously at random positions, and when the concentration is uh, high enough, the lattice collapses uh, to an amorphous state. And uh, neither of these models is right. Uh, that is, uh, both have uh, correct elements in them. They are. Uh, we have already earlier on the course told that uh, silicon does amorphize. You form amorphous pockets, which have been seen uh, both in simulations uh, and in experiments uh, on the nanometer uh, size scale. Uh, here, each, each dot here is an atom, so you can count that this is uh, few, uh, maybe 10 nanometers, uh, roughly this disordered zone here. But uh, even these people who uh, wrote and others who found these pockets, they concluded that there are not enough of the pockets to explain the amorphization of silicon. The point defects uh, are practically impossible to see in TEM uh, due to their mobility. They are moving somewhere before you see them. Well, uh, and uh, one can simulate this, uh, and uh, with molecular dynamics, you can simulate, uh, reproduce the amorphization. And uh, this uh, particular uh, simulation here uh, agreed within about a factor of two with the experimental amorphization doses. Uh, even though molecular dynamics does not have long-range defect migration, so it was actually a pretty good result. Uh, 
And as you can tell, it's really difficult to say is this uh, would this be direct impact or uh, or defect stimulated amorphization. Um, and, and this uh, actually turns out that uh, it's uh, there are elements of both, but uh, there are also other things going on. And uh, and uh, other many other groups have also uh, done many MD simulations uh, and uh, other kind of simulations on the same topic. Uh, and judging from all, getting all the literature together, there are at least eight different mechanisms which are active uh, when silicon is becoming amorphous. Uh, and uh, the relative magnitude of this depends then on the ion mass and ion energy, uh, and also whether it's a channeling or non-channeling condition. Okay, we don't, you don't have to, we don't for this course, you don't need to know in detail what exactly they mean, but uh, to give a flavor, there is this direct impact amorphization, there is defect stimulated heterogeneous amorphization, but then there is cascade induced amorphous zone growth at amorphous crystalline interstate, then there is cascade induced partial recrystallization, this acts against amorphization, and then there is recall induced defect recombination, which also uh, acts against amorphization. Uh, and all these, these five first mechanisms uh, happen in principle uh, even at zero Kelvin. Uh, they don't need any external thermal uh, activation. Then when you add thermal activation, which happens even at room temperature, uh, the defect becomes mobile thermally, and then you have interstitial vacancy recombination, you have a, can have thermal and linear damage, and you can have recrystallization of uh, interfaces by mobile defects. And in, so in reality, the amorphization of silicon is a balance between these eight factors, uh, which usually leads to amorphization. But uh, if the temperature is above 300 degrees C, or if the ion is a proton, then uh, these uh, recrystallization effects actually uh, uh, actually dominate, and uh, you don't uh, you don't amorphize the silicon at all. So it is actually quite complicated. But then, uh, finally, after the silicon is amorphized, uh, to make a working semiconductor circuit, you don't want amorphous silicon, you want crystalline silicon. So now, after the implantation, you have introduced the dopants, but the uh, structure is a mess, which you don't want. So after that, it has to be a, uh, the material has to be recrystallized. And this is done by high temperature, different kinds of high temperature annealing. Uh, typically high temperature here is uh, 700 degrees C or flash lamp annealing at 1000 or 1100 degrees C, so quite high temperatures. And this is the, when this is done first, you get small defect clusters uh, from uh, uh, after the silicon has recrystallized. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, this uh, after the annealing, uh, you have a uh, you can have also uh, dopant migration, and especially for boron, one of the standard uh, most important dopants of silico silicon, uh, there is a special variety of radiation enhanced diffusion called transient enhanced diffusion. Transient uh, refers here to the uh, that it's a transient process during the annealing itself, uh, which uh, uh, and uh, while uh, while the annealing is going on and the defect concentration changes. And this can move the dopants beyond the implant depth. And this was for a while actually a big uh, problem in how to handle this uh, TED uh, 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 process uh, before, uh, so that it doesn't uh, lead to the boron going too deep. But uh, uh, while, uh, while this annealing is going on, there are several stage stages of, re of reduced defect density. And these are illustrated uh, on, uh, on the following slides. And first you have small point defect clusters, then you go into so-called 311 defects and stacking faults, and uh, these uh, uh, emit and absorb interstitials. And finally, when the temperature is high enough and the time scale is long enough, they will emit all of their interstitials, which then end up as perfect dislocation, go in either to the surface and vanish at the surface, or they go into perfect dislocation loops and perfect dislocation loops uh, are stable enough that uh, they are, uh, won't be vanished anymore. But if their concentration is low enough, uh, it's no longer harmful to the silicon operation. And uh, without going into too much detail, schematically, uh, after the point defect clusters have been there, you have the small clusters uh, 
uh, for, uh, for the small point defect clusters uh, uh, first emit uh, all their interstitials and these go into 311 defects uh, which are rod-like defects and to some extent also to stacking faults uh, which we have dealt with earlier on the course uh, in that dislocation section. And this 301 defect uh, is uh, that has not been mentioned before on the course and it's a uh, quite special uh, defect uh, existing in tetrahedral semiconductors but not at all for instance in metals. And this uh, structure it has a complex geometry uh, it uh, contains a zigzag patterns of interstitial atoms ordered on 311 planes so that all atoms have tetrahedral coordination and hence are pretty stable. So in this image here on the left and on the right is perfect silicon. Here you see a complex network of uh, extra atoms uh, and uh, these extra atoms uh, lie, lie in the 113 direction. That is that this, the direction perpendicular to this plane uh, uh, of uh, atoms here is a 113 direction. And uh, so you can see it's a pretty complex geometry. Uh, but the interesting thing about the 113 defect is that uh, except at the edges, uh, all silicon atoms in the 113 defect have exactly four ne nearest neighbor. So it's clearly a defect, uh, but the bonding environment is, uh, has the correct number of bonds. And because of this, this uh, 311 defects are pretty stable. And this is a 301 defect is also interesting uh, in the sense that uh, uh, this is a linear, clearly this is a linear uh, defect or, uh, well, it has some thickness, but uh, in the big picture, it's uh, far away looking, it looks like a linear defect, but this is not a dislocation. Uh, and the reason to this is that if you form the Burger circuit uh, around this uh, uh, 301 defect, uh, you get a Burger vector of zero, and then by definition, it's not a dislocation. Okay, so never mind my drawing, of course. <laughs> it should be a square. Uh, square. It's a bit difficult to draw that by hand. And very in the very end, what happens uh, is that all three these three one ones have emit all the emitted all the extra atoms as interstitials, and the stacking faults have absorbed these or emitted their interstitials. But stacking faults can unfold. The planes can shift, and then you get uh, perfect dislocations. And when finally all the defects are in perfect dislocations or have vanished at the surface, uh, then the device uh, works as finally intended. So as you can see, it's quite a lot of uh, physics involved. Uh, in uh, the early 1990s, all of this was pretty poorly understood, but basically from the 1990s until about 2010-2015, one has reached uh, roughly this level of understanding uh, I have described now. So uh, now the very final part of the course, I'll give some other uh, effects of irradiation in less detail than this, uh, this silicon case, uh, which uh, I spent some time on, A, because it's important, and B, because uh, it has uh, lots of interesting physics in it. So, well, optical properties, uh, we mentioned that point defects uh, can change the color of materials, and this is also due to irradiation. Uh, so one can uh, change uh, the color uh, of uh, ionic crystals or jewels uh, with uh, irradiation. But uh, these, are, these optical effects have much more, uh, uh, much more new and much more uh, advanced applications. Uh, one, one of these, uh, this is an example of what has been demonstrated to work, is that, uh, is to how, that you can spe speed up a certain type of uh, semiconductor lasers called Wexel or vertical cavity surface emitting lasers. And these are uh, lasers uh, which are used in modern te telecommunications uh, in optical fibers to send gigahertz uh, frequency pulses. And now we don't need to go into the detail of this structure. It's a complicated semiconductor multilayer structure. Uh, but the part, uh, part is that uh, the mirror parts of this structure, one can be the uh, irradiation uh, in, uh, it decreased the decay time, which can be used to increase the speed of the uh, structures uh, quite significantly. And this is something which has been demonstrated to work, uh, work uh, at least in principle. Uh, then it's another question of where, whether it's used in the final uh, industrial process. And uh, this is something uh, which we studied uh, also that what is the reason to the speed up? 
and uh, it, uh, it, it turns out that uh, uh, it can be explained by considering defect clusters uh, that uh, if you look at the damage produced by the uh, uh, most efficient speed up comes for the heavy ions and the, this can be correlated with the defect cluster sizes so there are more large clusters uh, uh, for the heavy ion irradiations and these uh, large clusters with complicated structure as they act as uh, efficient uh, traps for charge carriers. Well, magnetic effect can also be used to modify by irradiation and uh, uh, the, this is an example where uh, platinum cobalt platinum multilayer structures were irradiated with 30 kV gallium ions and uh, measuring the magnetic uh, properties to change the ferromagnetism uh, of this uh, structure. And uh, in this case, uh, what happens is that uh, an initially non ferromagnetic uh, material could be made ferromagnetic, that is, you got this hysteresis loop uh, in the, uh, in the uh, difference between the magnetization uh, in the re re relation between the external magnetic field and the magnetization and this is of course the definition of ferromagnetism um, and the reasons were actually not uh, precisely known but uh, it's likely related to ion beam uh, mixing in the structures uh, and this is uh, something these, uh, these structures are important uh, Platinum cobalt, platinum multilayer structures are used in the read heads of, uh, uh, of read heads of uh, hard drives, computer hard drives. So this kind of effect can at least in principle be used to uh, make these hard drives uh, modify, uh, make better hard drive material, uh, hard drive read head materials. Well, chemical effects can also be modified. And uh, one typical example is change the surface chemistry because I, irradiation, low energy radiation changes the surface structure uh, and one can change the surface chemistry. And a classical example of this is uh, changing the hydrophobicity. That is hydrophobicity means how strongly a material repels water. And uh, this is a, a series of images with a water droplet on a mica surface. So this one is unirradiated, this one is irradiated 25E electrovolt, note, note the low energy electrovolt argon ions, uh, and, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, this one uh, is uh, aged, uh, aged, uh, aged sample, and you see that uh, after the irradiation you get a very high hydrophobicity, and still after 84 days it's clearly more hydrophobic than it was uh, before the irradiation. And this uh, is uh, related to how the surface layer structure in the material changes and how that uh, uh, affects the water uh, adhesion on the surface. But uh, the surface chemistry issues are often complicated and uh, in this case, uh, at least when the paper was published, the detailed mechanism was not known. And then a funny example, uh, sort of non-obvious example, uh, is that you can protect wood against termites. Uh, that is, uh, by irradiation, uh, irradiating wood with 1 kV uh, hydrogen uh, uh, molecules, uh, molecular ions, uh, you reduce, dramatically reduce the rate at which termites eat the wood. <laughs> As you can tell, uh, this is a very different use of ion irradiation than the one in the sil silicon uh, industry. The, the for silicon industry is a very high-tech, uh, multi-billion-dollar industry, and this uh, here it's something quite different. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing is it uh, worked. Uh, of course, this may not be the economically best way to find a uh, treat wood against uh, uh, protect wood against termites, but at least it's a, an interesting example of how many ways uh, ions can be used uh, to modify materials in useful ways. Well, another uh, actually uh, possibly much uh, uh, clearly a uh, very significant method is to uh, use radioactive ion implantation into stents. Uh, that is, stents are, uh, are uh, artificial blood veins or, or nets put into blood veins uh, uh, to prevent them from closing up. Uh, as I'm sure you know, heart disease is the one of the most common ways of uh, uh, death and, uh, and um, 
and so it's important that one of the ways to treat heart disease is to in, in the uh, standard ways to treat heart disease is introduce these stents which then uh, keep the veins open and uh, and let the blood flow and in this case uh, it's of course very important that the stent uh, that much stuff is not sticking into the stent uh, because that would again uh, prevent the useful effects uh, and uh, and one way to do this has really been to use radioactive ion implantation uh, and uh, to improve, uh, which uh, prevents the blood uh, from sticking there. What happens is that the radioactive isotopes naturally uh, slowly decay and the radiation from the decay keeps the stent in a state where blood does not stick. And this has been really demonstrated to work. Of course, uh, you may wonder, is it a good idea to implant radioactive materials permanently into a human? But uh, in this particular case, uh, it may actually be beneficial because the radioactivity levels can be low and uh, are known, and they may be less harmful uh, than the risk of a heart attack uh, in the patient. Uh, and in that case, it uh, can be medically, uh, medically motivated to do this. And, uh, and uh, there are uh, uh, also biological effects of, uh, or practical application uh, of biological effects. And section seven, whole section seven dealt with uh, cancer treatment, uh, but uh, so we don't repeat that one. But uh, uh, another uh, way to use radiation is to kill bacteria, that is to sterilize stuff. Uh, and, uh, and this is something which typically electron irradiation or gamma irradiation is used for sterilization, and this is uh, quite uh, quite routinely used uh, in the food uh, food uh, food industry. Uh, uh, also, plasma treatment is used to sterilize medical equipment. And uh, an extreme example of this uh, sterilization is that when there was the uh, some idiot was centering uh, letters with anthrax uh, to. Uh, to government officials in the U.S. in 2001, uh, the Postal Service started electron irradiating all government mails uh, sent in the Washington area uh, up to quite high doses to kill any anthrax spores. Um, uh, that uh, uh, at this was working. It had the downside that the letter paper turned uh, tended to turn yellowish because of the high radiation uh, used. And uh, in living cells, uh, it's uh, actually uh, irradiating living cells is, of course, uh, what happens during cancer treatment. But the physics of this is actually something which uh, uh, can be studied in uh, cell cultures. And uh, it's actually quite uh, amazing how complicated it is. Uh, there is at least one group in uh, Germany uh, who have a special facility that allow irradiating living cells while watching them in a microscope. Uh, and by using then, uh, uh, and also there are single ion irradiation facility where you irradiate really one ion at a time. Uh, and then you can see how a single ion uh, can modify living cells. And, uh, and uh, what they do is they uh, irradiate the cell nucleus where the DNA is and then follow by using these biological uh, labeling methods uh, what happens in the cell uh, after the radiation. Uh, and um, and it's uh, quite uh, uh, str uh, well compared to all that other stuff in the course. This is really strange and fascinating how it happens. Um, so what happens is that uh, you damage in one place, uh, but the repair is uh, an, uh, observed much later uh, and uh, not at the same position. A much here uh, is uh, time scales so of human time scales about 15 minutes. And this is quite remarkable because a swift heavy ion, when it passes through something, it passes the time scale is attoseconds. Uh, so the actual DNA damage uh, is starts at an attosecond time scale, but then the biological processes spend then minute repairing this. And also the reparation may not be is not exactly where the ion hit. So this is uh, quite uh, fascinating and uh, uh, not fully understood at all. But uh, it seems that uh, uh, what most likely happens is that uh, the, what the swift heavy ion does, it induces radicals uh, uh, or, uh, I mean, ions in the uh, water and the other uh, liquids surrounding the nucleus. And these radicals, when the concentration is high enough, uh, 
they damage the DNA, but uh, then uh, biological processes observe that the DNA is damaged uh, and go there and repair this. And uh, this is a well a general feature of biology that uh, uh, the uh, that uh, biological processes can not only uh, can uh, repair damage done to DNA, and this is uh, actually one of the reasons uh, where, uh, we are doing so well. Otherwise, uh, uh, cancer rates would be horrendously high compared to what uh, what they actually are. Uh, maybe high enough that life wouldn't be a complex life wouldn't be possible at all. And here is a little bit of details uh, which uh, describes what I just described in some uh, uh, some uh, more moments. Uh, uh, we don't. Uh, if you are not a specialist in biology, you probably do not uh, uh, quite understand this. To be honest, I'm not a specialist in biology, so I do not uh, fully understood this. But in any way, it uh, gives a taste of what's happening and how this. Uh, uh, how this uh, damage ca can be observed, and also how the re repair processes uh, can be can be observed. And finally, uh, I'll mention uh, sort of a beautiful uh, beautiful example of uh, irradiation. Sometimes irradiation is deliberately used to make mutations, and uh, this is uh, something which is uh, much of a regular breeding uh, in biology, uh, breeding of plants, uh, livestock uh, uh, rely, uh, relies on finding useful mutations and then breeding uh, those uh, plants or uh, or individual uh, animals uh, which have the useful mutations. And, uh, and um, and these uh, these mutations may be induced by any means, by natural processes, by chemicals, and so on. But one way is irradiation. So uh, irradiation has been used to induce mutations in, uh, for instance, cotton and rice, and so on. It's particularly useful to do it in seeds because seeds are small, so one can uh, really get through through the whole seed or at least deep enough in the seed to modify the damage, uh, and then uh, uh, and then uh, breed the, uh, let the plants grow and uh, see what happens. And of course, in most cases, the mutations are harmful and the seeds don't germinate at all or, or, or they don't grow in a better way. But occasionally one may get a beneficial effect uh, and then uh, this can uh, this can read to beautiful effects. Like, for instance, in these studies here, uh, they show that uh, irradiating flowers produce new shapes of flowers, which uh, didn't originally uh, ex exist, uh, uh, exist in uh, nature. So that was the final practical example mentioned, and as I emphasized uh, many times, this is not an exhaustive list. There are many, many other practical applications in radiation, but this was just to give a flavor of what everything is possible. But as I also indicated, some of these uh, applications had been demonstrated in the labs, but uh, were likely not in the industrial production. Uh, and this is something which uh, always is uh, good to keep in mind uh, for scientists that uh, in the end, uh, if Get a practical application. You need to also to consider cost, uh, and um, if something co it's co cost a fortune to make, uh, it's uh, not very likely to make it into a practical applications. Uh, here we although have to remember that it may be okay if it costs a fortune in the beginning, and then if it's beneficial, then uh, if one can upscale the production, it may uh, actually become affordable, uh, and. Um, and, uh, and this is something which has happened, for instance, this semiconductor technology example. Accelerators in the 1950s, 60s were certainly considered expensive and complicated, but because in the 60s it was demonstrated that this silicon processing it gives uh, sizable benefits, then uh, industry started getting in and making uh, implanters which are affordable enough and efficient enough uh, for large-scale production, and this then led to them uh, being routinely used. Um, and uh, and also some uh, some of the ion beams equipment is not expensive at all. For instance, a regular small ion gun uh, can cost only like a few thousand euros, uh, and uh, uh, they can go to a few kV energy. So for many of the effects mentioned here, that may actually be enough. And also plasmas are not necessarily expensive at all, and uh, one can do make plasmas relatively cheap, uh, and they can achieve very high flashes and hence also be fast.
So because of this, I mean, these KEV ion beams are quite widely used in many industrial applications, as mentioned. The fifth heavy ions here, the issue, of course, is more severe because uh, to get the high, high mega electrovolt ions, you need a quite, quite big accelerator. But uh, the point is that uh, the, uh, in these cases, uh, for the swift heavy ion effects, like making the nano uh, rods uh, I, I showed earlier, the fluence, uh, you only need a few ions. So, uh, so once you have the accelerator, you can use a small uh, ion, so the time is small, and then the cost may in the end not be prohibitive. But uh, still the limiting factor is you need, if you need both high energy and high fluence uh, irradiations, then uh, cost may uh, remains an issue and may very well be a showstopper. Uh, but uh, as you show, there are many, many applications and, uh, and uh, many more uh, can still be uh, coming. And maybe you will invent uh, one additional practical applications or ion implantation or uh, some other kind of irradiation uh, sometime during your career.